Hello, Professor. This is Sean McGarry. In my midterm project, I've decided to do a video uh, rather than a paper. Uh, do sort of a let's play narrated walkthrough. Uh, and I decided that uh, for both, both your and my sake, it's a bit more interesting, palatable than reading and writing 10 pages. Uh, so I'm going to do. Uh, this new game came out about two weeks ago, uh, Sekiro, by the by the uh, studio who made famously Dark Souls, Bloodborne, Demon Souls, those games. Uh, this and I'm going to go through these five elements that you've laid out here and uh, just expand a little on the guiding questions that you've given here. So. This game, uh, in a few words or less, is just the story of a uh, a warrior from a very fictional take on 16th century Japan. Uh, I chose this particular game because, uh, simply because I'm playing it right now, uh, I've been enjoying it a lot, and I thought it'd be a, a fun way to dive into a, a talk about narrative and mechanics specifically. Uh, this game is not the greatest for maybe to talk about narrative, but the first three modules we've done have, have been more about design and, and mechanical elements, so I figured I'd do a mechanical heavy game first and, and dive into something narratively heavy, maybe for the final. So, take a look at it here. This game falls under the, uh, very much under the action-adventure archetype. Uh, as you can see, it's a kind of a just a third-person hack-and-slash. You've got a sword, a number of weapons, and throwing stars, and axes, and such. Uh, the core design features to me for this game, uh, if I can go to uh, knowledge, thoughts on it. Uh, they talk a bit about the different kind of archetypes your game can take, uh, and ultimately what the, the base goal of the player is going to be. And using their definitions, I put this under a conflict kind of game. Uh, not necessarily against other players, but against the game itself. And if, if you played uh, Dark Souls or Bloodborne or some of their series before, you, you know very much what that's about. Uh, it's the player's fighting against uh, what are famously very difficult games where you're expected to fail and, and die a lot. And again, Knowledge Guru talks uh, about not the goal for the game, but, but what the outcome for the player should be um, and why they should get satisfaction. And uh, I this really falls into the triumph category. The, the You should really get... Uh, something out of this game by finishing and moving on, finishing a section moving on to another one. So as far as this game looks, uh, you've seen a little bit now, It's it's got a very much Japanese aesthetic. aesthetic. And then... As far as what the players are expected to do in this game, uh, you can see I'm kind of jumping around and looking for stuff. It's kind of an exploration game, uh, and I'll come back to that a little bit more later in the narrative aspect as well. It's very much an exploration game. Uh, but ultimately, at a base mechanical level, what the player should be trying to do is to master a set of mechanics, apply them to a specific situation to a point that they can succeed on that situation uh, relatively consistently, and then uh, be able to move on from there. So as you can see, I'm, I'm going through this fairly well uh, without really taking any damage because uh, I've got about 15 hours in this game so far in this beginning, and uh, frankly, I've died plenty of times to be able to complete even this first section. And this um, really ties into 
stuff that uh, Rafe Coster and uh, James G were, were saying as well. They they say that a G says that a, a game is like a, a test that continually teaches you and uh, tests you at the same time. And that's really what this comes down into. So, so you'll see this game is not quite linear, it's kind of open, but it it is kind of divided up into sections with large chunks of enemies that you have to sneak around or, or kill or eliminate in some way before you can move forward. Uh, like this section here, you can see spotted around are lots of buildings, enemies hiding all about. Um, and this, it, the game will introduce different kinds of enemies, uh, different ways to apply your skill set, and again, master one skill and move on. Coster says that... Um, says that mastering something in a game is, is really where we derive our pleasure from it. And uh, he says it's almost it's almost like uh, learning the drug, uh, where you're presented with something, you master it, you feel good because of it, and then the game presents you with new things to master. So, uh, I'll talk about it from mechanical sense at first. We'll get to the narrative sense of interacting later. Um, the In the mechanical sense, this game plays in a... They really tried to lock down the sword fighting uh, aspect of this aesthetic, and that's how you interact with it, is it's a, uh, you get into duels where you have to alternate between attacking and dodging and, and blocking, and, uh, it becomes sort of a, uh, kind of a game of rock, paper, scissors, almost, where, uh, you have to, you have to decide what the best option is. You you're given a very basic skill set that uh, almost doesn't change really. You've got dodge, jump, block, and attack, and, and really these same four moves are just applied over and over. But against enemies who react to them differently, that's the interactivity. Really, is each enemy is going to interact to each one differently, and then on top of that, you're constantly getting new enemies who will interact to them in different ways. So, as far as how feedback in this game is presented, uh, it's actually presented very well. Uh, so, you've got a very standard uh, kind of heads-up display. You can see health bars uh, for me in the bottom left corner and for the enemies over their heads. Uh, you see, uh, you see the uh, small yellow bar pop up at the bottom. It ca acts kind of like stamina in this game, uh, though they take kind of a new stance where uh, you can attack stamina directly. Uh, you can either win by running someone out of health or stamina. Uh, kind of an interesting concept. But... Uh, So you get uh, that aspect, uh, sort of a, an undiegetic aspect, and then also uh, there's there's a few really nice sound cues as well. Uh, every time you block a, a blade, sparks will uh, come off of it, and uh, the different sounds and the different um, amounts of sparks that it makes uh, indicates uh, your your best option as far as dodging and attacking and uh, disengaging, blocking and and so on. Uh, so, all, all some really nice sound elements. So, now let's move on a little bit and, and let's talk about interaction as far as the narrative goes. And uh, I won't say that there's too much. Uh, again, if you've, if you've played Dark Souls, you have any experience with, with this uh, developer in the past, if you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, this one has more than probably the other ones in the series, but it's still not a ton. 
Uh, it's somewhere, if we're going by uh, Marcello Bacucci's uh, ideas about the different kinds of narrative archetypes, it's somewhere between discovery and almost a full sandbox. Uh, and I say that because uh, I mentioned earlier that it is semi-linear, but uh, it's sort of sandbox and then nothing's really gated. If you have the skills to beat the enemies to progress, nothing is off-limits to you. Uh, so it falls somewhere in between the two. Uh, but as far as story, uh, somewhere between 10 and 15 hours and I've had two cutscenes. That's the whole story I've gotten so far. And like other games in, by this developer, you really get as much of the story as you try and get out of it. Uh, so, for example, um, certain inventory will have names or, or small amounts of flavor text on it that you, you can read and try and meet out the just an idea of the world from it and uh, in a second here i'll show you something else a little bit more of an active way we get story here uh, but it's very much uh you go out and find as much of the story as you want there is in some sense a, an overarching story here it is uh if you ever catch two of the enemies next to each other you can eavesdrop and they'll give you tidbits of, the, of information about uh, their army and the, the people and names in the world but that's it's really as far as we get um, as in-game story goes uh, i think one of the things that this company excels with though is uh, kind of the mystery. Uh, you you mentioned that games are also part of a larger media ecology, and stories can also be the story of the game, but the story of how you played the game. And I think that's one of the cool parts that having an, ex an exceedingly difficult series of games has made it is uh, you can find stories of people saying, "Oh, it took me, you know." A hundred tries to beat this section of the game. Someone else might say, "Oh, I, I got them on the first try, but uh, this other section took me so long." And uh, communities, uh, games like this, because of how difficult it is. And for example, uh, we're almost exactly two weeks from release date on this game, and, and even now we've got uh, the Reddit community who's thriving and someone has made a whole map shown here uh, of the game and various bosses checkpoints items that you can pick up uh, so I think that's what's really cool uh, even even though the diegetic narrative is not exactly flush the uh, out of the game narrative is is a really cool thriving community uh, as far as, so, is it clear what's happening in the game? Not always. There's kind of an overarching story, but just barely. Uh, and it's very easy to just get lost in the world and forget that you have a story entirely. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you an example here while I've got this map up. Uh, this checkpoint right here, that's about where I am. And I know that this boss right here from from the few spoilers i've gotten uh that's my next major story beat so realistically i i'm not that far away from actually progressing the story just two checkpoints and and a boss fight there uh but i got to this checkpoint decided that getting to the next one was uh it felt a little like pounding my head on a brick wall and i just could not get there so i decided uh oh i'm gonna go off uh, this way, and this way, and then this way, and now I'm down here somewhere, I've made it over here somewhere, even though they're not, these areas aren't really even related to anything I'm doing, um, so, again, there's really no guiding, uh, there's really nothing guiding there, uh, you, you vaguely have a main quest about, uh, the, this character, Seikuro, is uh, he's a warrior who's uh, 
pledge to a, a local lord and your lord has been kidnapped and go out and find him. That's basically how the game starts is, is puts you in the world and says, go. Um, and I'm looking for a name here. Constance, Constance, uh, Steinkuhler. She talks a bit about, uh, she defines game narrative as well-defined problems wrapped inside ill-defined problems. So for me, the well-defined problem is getting from point A to point B. I think you could probably say that for uh, any part of this game. And I'll give you an example here. So right now, this is this is about how far I've progressed in this game. This is where I'm at currently, and I know that that tower. That tower right there is where I need to go. I know because an NPC has told me in the world. I've been far enough up the tower to see that there's rooms I can explore. I've seen treasure inside them through windows. I know that something is there. Uh, however, between me and that tower are a lot of very annoying enemies around this corner. And so it's a matter of and for some reason, they're not here. Huh, that is strange. So, looks like a loading issue there. But, um, oh, there they are. So, for me, my well-defined, or my well-defined problem right now is I have a bunch of guys standing between me and where I would like to go, which is up there. Uh, and I just can't quite seem to deal with them all. So, again, well-defined problem, point A to point B. It's very simple, but ill-defined problem, so it's well-defined problems inside an ill-defined problem. The ill-defined problem is, I guess, how do I go find the person that I'm supposed to find in this game? And the answer so far is, I'm not really sure. Uh, we, we have really no clues about where they are, uh, how to find them what will progress that goal uh, again I've found multiple branching pathways that I can explore and uh, but I have no real indication that anyone is giving me progress more than just moving forward and finding more enemies. so in, in that sense no it's it's not really what is happening in an overarching narrative of this game. Uh, so back to interactivity though now let's talk about ways that uh, relate to narrative rather than mechanics. Um, so how does interactivity play into the way the game structures the story? Uh, I think it's cool that you can take the story at your own pace. Uh, again, I can go off wherever I want in ways that's good, in ways that's bad. Um, and the, the video by the YouTube channel uh, Extra Credits uh, talks about that as it's, it is kind of hard to actually build a, a game with a heavy narrative if you do give your player just the option to go wherever. So uh, you could almost say that it is just an artistic choice by From Software to be very story light on it. Uh, and it's, it doesn't really give the player an obligation to be any uh, one place at once. So I could see that it's a, maybe a conscious choice. Uh, and it's and it is cool because for some places, uh, giving you the story at your own play, own pace is is kind of nice. For example, this uh, this checkpoint right here. If I show you the map again, uh, it's this whole semi-red section here is uh, the backstory to the game. Actually, uh, you aren't given a backstory. It starts off with uh, you have lost your memory. You know something important happened on some night. That's about the information you're given. And so it's entirely optional. You can decide to go explore the backstory of this game at your own pace uh, and get it uh, however you want. Uh, I went and did it all at once, but you can 
you get a little bit of information the more you progress along here. So you can just go uh, do it. It's kind of a side adventure as you choose. Uh, so that that was a cool aspect of having this sort of narrative lights, uh, sandboxy uh, sort of world that they've made here. And it's, uh, and it's cool because Marcello Picucci, he, he talks about how the game developer is sort of a narrator and the player is the narratee, the one who is being narrated to. Uh, and when, when that goes together, when the player experiences a story and the developer gives it to them, uh, he says it becomes narration. It's a collaborative effort. So that's, in a sense, you making your own story. Uh, and it's kind of, the again, back to the meta story of, oh, well, you can talk to people and say, oh, well, I, I went to this place first and someone else had, might have an entirely different experience. Say, no, I ignored that until the end of the game. I went to this place first. Um, so that's, again, one of the reasons why these games uh, create such a good word of mouth advertising in my opinion so to wrap it up player experience uh so let's uh we'll get a little less academic here and just talk a little more, a bit more about how i felt in this game so how does it feel to play the game uh incredibly challenging uh if i haven't made that clear enough it's uh does feel like running into a brick wall over and over again sometimes uh, but sometimes it, it can feel very strategic, uh, which is cool for a game that's not a strategy game. I'll pull up an example here. Uh, here's a here's a mini boss fight, and I've already done it, so I can't show it to you in my game. But here's a guy on YouTube doing it. And when you get these. Uh, when you get these kind of one-on-one -on -one duels, it, it becomes this sort of strategy battle of uh, when can I when can I push in? When do I have to block? When do I have to dodge? And uh, I think it was very uh, simple on paper, but complex in execution uh, style of combat. It worked out very well. Uh, so the the. Developers have gone on record saying that they wanted to capture the feel of getting into a one-on-one -on -one sort of samurai duel, and I think they did it really well. Um, did I what I was supposed to do for in a gameplay sense and mechanical sense? Yes, uh, that's that's one of the great things about this uh, this game, as well as other games that they've made, is uh, with the exception of uh, Armored Core, which is a different different thing entirely but the dark souls demon souls bloodborne stick row all those series uh you are given very simple options i understood mechanically right away that this was going to be a game of uh hit and don't get hit uh i think they present that very clearly uh but on the other hand did i understand what i was supposed to narratively uh kind of um in the first five minutes the, again, you're an, an NPC that you're trying to protect gets kidnapped. So give them the story, go find them. But beyond that, and did I feel like I had any control over what was happening in the game story? No, really. Again, I felt like where I went uh, at will, and that that's really only gated by your ability to defeat the enemies wherever you go. Uh, for example, I, uh, I was exploring, and I came upon uh, what I think was a very late game section. I found a small cavern that, that led somewhere that I, I'm fairly sure I was not supposed to be at yet, because I died very quickly. Uh, quick, quicker than usual, I should say. Um, and I found a couple of those so far, and you're just really allowed to go. but uh, as far as control over the game story, not really. There's very little input that you can give to NPCs. Uh, you can... Basically, all the NPCs that you find that are friendly are and end up almost being item vending machines. 
uh, so the, the extra credits YouTube channel, they, they talk a little bit about choice and meaningful choice. And they say that choices for a choice to be meaningful, it has to feel like you have two options, two different outcomes, and you don't really get that here. I would by no means classify this a meaningful choice game. You, uh, I think really the only choice I've gotten was at one point, uh, I met a man who asked me for money and said it was to open a shop, and the option was to give him money or not. And even if you don't, he's still there. You can go back and do it anytime. So really no consequences. And uh, again, once you make that choice, he becomes an NPC item. Uh, uh, so to wrap it up, did I enjoy the game? Well, not finished yet, but so far, uh, yeah, I've been having a lot of fun with it. Um, not really a game you play for the story, but I just put 75 hours into Witcher 3, which is a game you play for the story. I need something a little lighter, maybe. So, uh, yeah, I think I, I've been having fun. What makes it fun for me is uh, going back to G and Coster is really just the mastery of skills. Going to one section, mastering it, being able to get past it consistently, and then uh, becoming a better player for it, and then moving on. Uh, so, really looking forward to it. Um, and that is that is my video. Thank you for watching. Um, I know I took a little bit of a narrative light take on it for a narrative on video games class. Uh, that was enough for you. More than happy to do another video. You don't have to do much to get me talking about video games for 20 minutes. So, uh, yeah, let me know what you think, and thanks for watching.